Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, and this is the first in a series of videos about Nibbana, or Nirvana in Sanskrit. Nibbana is Pali, and it means going out. Sometimes it's translated extinction, but that's not really a very good translation, um, unless you understand it in the context of a fire. When a fire goes out, it's said to be extinguished. So Nibbana means extinction in that context. It doesn't mean extinction like it's the end of everything. <laughs> but rather that the self, the I, goes out like a fire. Think about it this way. Let's say we have a fire burning, depending on a piece of wood for fuel. Now what happens when the wood runs out? What happens when the fuel is exhausted? The fire goes out, right? Well, where does it go? The question is meaningless. It's simply an expression that we say it goes out. That means it's extinguished. The fire is no more. Because what we have is a dependent causation. The fire is dependent on the wood. As soon as the wood is extinguished, the fire goes out. Similarly, what we have in this life is a state of beingness, a state of becoming. And that is also dependent on a certain fuel, and that fuel is desire. As soon as that desire is used up, finished, then the fire of being is also extinguished. And that's what we mean by Nibbana. Now when we say being and becoming, we mean manifesting in the material world, in space and time, by a process of causality, causation, which we call dependent origination, paticca samupada. So what Nibbana really means is the end of the process of becoming, the end of wandering on, samsara, the end of birth and death. In fact, it means the decay of decay, the death of death, and also the end of birth. If there's no process of becoming, then how can we be born? And if there's no being born, then there's no decay and death. So try to understand. When we meditate, the aim is Nibbana. It doesn't matter whether we're in meditating as a Buddhist or as a yogi or in some other way. The end is always Nibbana. Nibbana means the end of becoming. It means realizing our real self. Not the phony, false, temporary self that we call I. But something much bigger than that. Something that's so big that the whole world shows up in it. That's Nibbana. And whether we're talking about Buddhism or Taoism or yoga or any other type of meditation, that's the actual aim. Otherwise, what's the meaning of meditation? If meditation is uh, just to be a little calmer or just to be a little less confused or even to increase our effectiveness in the workplace like these mindfulness people are talking about now, that's not meditation at all. That's simply another form of conditioning the mind. It's really not very advanced, not very powerful, compared to what's actually possible. What's actually possible is the complete cessation of suffering through stopping the process of becoming. 
That's the real meaning of Nibbana, Nirvana, Enlightenment, Samadhi. All of these things point to the same state. So when someone says, I have realized the Tao, or I have realized the Brahman, or I have realized Samadhi, or Enlightenment, or Nirvana, it all points to the same thing. And that thing is Nibbana. Without that, really, the process of meditation is more or less useless, <laughs> quite frankly. Has no purpose, has no final goal. It always amuses me that when people teach yoga, they teach the asanas, the exercises, but they don't teach the purpose of the asanas. Yoga has eight limbs eight stages. And the first two are called yama and niyama. What must be done, what must not be done. And then only you can begin to study asana. And asana is, is the process to make the body supple. Why? Because the next stage is pranayama, regulation of the breath. Then patyahara, withdrawal of the mind from the senses. Then dharana, concentration, dhyana, meditation, and finally samadhi. Samadhi means totally stopping the mind, allowing the mind to revert to its original state before it becomes conscious in this world, before it becomes entangled with the senses. And to do that, you have to give up desire. Every single bona fide process of meditation aims at the same state, whether it's Buddhist or Taoist or Zen or what have you. So when we talk about meditation, real meditation means approaching Nibbana. Now we're going to speak in terms of the Buddha's teaching. So I'm using the Pali word Nibbana. But the principle is the same for any approach to self-realization. We have to have a final goal for the mind. If the goal of the mind is simply enjoyment, then the mind can never reach a stable state because the object of enjoyment is always going to change. Let's say, uh, for example, when I was young, when I was really young, a little baby, all I wanted was my mother's milk and attention and affection. But then later on, my objects of enjoyment changed. And then I wanted to play with my friends and run around and ride bicycles and stuff. And then even later on, it became more like electronics and music and flying model airplanes and science and stuff like that. Then after that, it became girls. <laughs> And so many things. I've had so many relationships in this life, and the object of enjoyment keeps changing. And it will continue because all of those objects of enjoyment are temporary, changeable, imperfect, unsatisfying, and ultimately non self. So these are the characteristics of the material existence. Everything in this world is constantly changing. It's impermanent. And as any scientist will tell you, the atomic structure is constantly vibrating. Nothing is still even for a moment. There's really no peace. Everything is vibration. That's why this world is called dukkha or suffering, or actually it means unsatisfactory. No matter how good our objects of enjoyment are, I can have the latest car or the latest computer or the latest corporate jet <laughs> or the latest uh, hot model in my bed. But what good does it do me? Because these things are all temporary. They're all going to break down. They're all going to go away. All our friends are going to die and we're going to die too. So even this body is not permanent. This mind is not permanent. In fact, the mind is the most impermanent thing there is. So, how can we find peace in this world? 
we have to approach Samadhi and Nibbana. This is where peace is to be found. Now, unfortunately, the great traditions of the world, meditative traditions, yogic traditions, even the Buddha's tradition, have become diluted, have become diverted from their original goals. Now, instead of doing yoga to attain samadhi, people do yoga to get a small waistline <laughs> or improve their health in other ways. Now, instead of practicing Buddhism to attain nibbana, Buddhists, even monks, openly say that it's impossible to attain nibbana. So we might as well just go for material benefits by cultivating merit. And even those Buddhists who do admit the existence of Nibbana, for example, the Zen people, they get Nibbana confused with nothingness or nihilism. So Nibbana is not nihilism. Nibbana is not anything. In fact, Nibbana is not a thing at all. It's a state a state of being in which the process of becoming has stopped. There was one famous story about the Buddha. There was a great murderer called Angulimala. Angulimala means a necklace of fingers because each person he killed, he would cut off the finger and add it to his necklace. Great guy, huh? So he wanted to... Uh, killed the Buddha. That was going to be his crowning achievement as a murderer. So he was chasing the Buddha in the forest. And the Buddha appeared to move away from him very fast. As far as, far as he could approach the Buddha, then the Buddha would also move away from him. But the Buddha wasn't walking. The Buddha was simply standing. So Angulimala could not understand how the Buddha was escaping his clutches. And he said, stop, stop. But the Buddha turned and said to him, Angulimala, I have already stopped. What about you? And Angulimala was struck by this because he understood the Buddha's meaning, that the Buddha had stopped the process of becoming. He had stopped the process of creating a material manifestation. And as soon as you do that, you attain enlightenment. Or rather, you are enlightenment. You are enlightened. Because as soon as the mind has no final goal, or as soon as the final goal of the mind is Nibbana, it's another way to say the same thing, then it automatically becomes luminous and transparent, peaceful and pleasant. And this is the secret of meditation. Now, to attain meditation is one of the items of the Noble Eightfold Path. However, it's not the first item. It's the last. Why is that? Because the first item in the Eightfold Path is right view. We have to have the right view, the right philosophy, the right ontology, the right idea of what meditation is, what life is, what things are all about. Otherwise, our meditation is useless. It's not going to lead to Nibbana. And since the goal of meditation is Nibbana, then we're wasting our time. So in order not to waste our time, the Buddha recommends we begin from right view. And of course, the right view with regard to meditation is the goal of meditation is Nibbana. So what is Nibbana? That's the question. And of course, there's a great deal of confusion about this. Uh, even great Buddhist scholars, great writers, and great monks of the past are confused about this. 
They really don't understand what Nibbana is. They think it's a thing that you can get or a place that you can go. But the Buddha didn't talk like that. He talked about the process to attain Nibbana. That's the middle path. When you hear the Buddha speak in the suttas, he says, the Tathagata, talking about himself, has done away with positions. In other words, I like this, I don't like that, I agree with this, I disagree with that. This is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is false. He said, I have done away with all these extreme positions, extreme views. And I follow the middle path. And what is the middle path? The process of causation. The process of becoming. It's called paticca samupada, which means the ways of becoming causal effects. Everything that happens is dependent on a cause, and that cause is dependent on a previous cause, and so on and so on, back to the original cause, which is ignorance and desire. Ignorance and desire are two words for the same thing. So until we can reduce our desires down to the point where the only thing we desire is enlightenment, itself, and we're going to be stuck in this process of causation, this process of karma, this process of becoming. As soon as we can let go of this desire and remain neutral, then we open up the possibility of attaining Nibbana. And even though I use the word attaining as if Nibbana is like a thing, I'm only using the conventional terminology, well knowing that Nibbana is not a thing. It's a state. So we're going to begin this series of inquiring into what is Nibbana. And even though we can't describe Nibbana directly, because it's a non-being, a non-becoming, a state of freedom from causality, it's impossible to describe, but we can talk around it about the conditions required to attain it, about the process needed to realize it, and about the qualities that you have to develop in yourself to have this possibility of Nibbana. This is going to be a long series, probably our longest ever but it's also going to be the highest and the best. Everything we've done so far, all the other playlists that you see on YouTube or on our site are just preliminary to this series. And if you haven't gone through our other series, do yourself a favor and go back and review the Foundation series, the Matrix Learning series, and so on, as recommended on our website. That will give you the background and the conceptual tools to understand this series, which is very high, very difficult. Okay? Um, you might say, well, why are you doing such a difficult subject? Why are you uh, trying to explain the most difficult thing, the most esoteric thing? Well, the answer is, I've already explained everything else. <laughs> Everything else is there already on the site. I'm not going to repeat myself, but rather I'm going to tie all those threads together into a comprehensive explanation of Nibbana. So please follow this playlist. Go through the videos one by one. It will start very slowly. In fact, the first few may be rather difficult because it's going to be about terminology and scholarship and how ideas developed in the Buddhist Sangha and so on. But this is necessary background, is necessary to understand the actual concepts of Nibbana and the path to Nibbana and how they developed. So please bear with us. If you care about enlightenment, if you want to actually attain Nibbana, this information is absolutely necessary. 
And at the beginning, I have to offer my pranams and thanks to my mentor, Bhikkhu Jnanananda. Jnanananda is probably the foremost scholar of Nibbana, at least in the English language that I'm aware of, that I was able to find. And he's one of the most senior monks in Sri Lanka. He's doing a wonderful job communicating the actual philosophy of Theravada Buddhism, having realized it for himself. And so I'm humbly following in his footsteps and uh, very grateful to him for giving me the permission to use his research uh, and uh, his materials in the preparation of this series. So please take your time. Review the videos carefully. Use our methodology revealed in Matrix Learning to understand the terminology. And also read the documentation that accompanies these. And the links will be in the description of the video. Uh, that way you will be able to follow the reasoning uh, behind these explanations on the videos, which will be kind of a commentary on the text. So... Uh, please wish us well and give us your full attention for this most important subject, the secret treasure of Nibbana. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta